I now move on to questions for the Minister for Communities. Before I call the first person on the list, I can advise members that question, questions number 9 and 13 have been withdrawn and topical questions number 7 and 10 have been withdrawn. I call on Ms Paula Bradshaw. Number one, please. Uh, I thank the member for her question, um, and I'm sure she'll be pleased to know that I'm meeting with the Men's Alliance (NI) to discuss support for male victims of domestic abuse. Uh, last year, a total of 1,088 households fleeing domestic violence were accepted as statutory homeless, and therefore they were considered full duly applicants. And also in this year, between April 1st of April and the 31st of August. 59 single males presented as homeless site in domestic violence, and of which 41 have to date been accepted as homeless. During 2019 and the 2020 budget, the Housing Executive spent just under £13 million supporting households uh, who are homeless or threatened with homelessness. This fund enables the Housing Executive to support men suffering from domestic abuse through the delivery of its statutory duties such as the provision of temporary accommodation and furniture storage. Additionally, the Housing Executive also supports a range of organisations that are there to provide support to service and services to households who are homeless or threatened with homelessness, including men suffering from domestic abuse. Ms Bradshaw. Thank you, Minister. Um, in the list of Housing Executive's housing-related support under the Supporting People programme, one of the categories refers to women at risk of domestic violence. Given what you've just said, it seems that the practice is out of line with the policy. Are you going to review the policy to bring it up to date so it doesn't discriminate against men? Well, I won't be discriminating against anyone, um, and the member will probably appreciate that the support in people has been out for a long time. Now, and it's not to say that there wasn't any domestic violence with men. There was, but it certainly didn't you know, reach the, a number that allowed it to be included in supporting people, and I'm happy to look at that because it is about being inclusive. Dr Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed, and I thank the Minister for her remarks so far. Uh, I would just ask the Minister if she would uh, undertake a review in, from the Northern Ireland Housing Executive that seems to only allocate, I understand from a constituency work just today, 20 points for the issues of domestic abuse. And I think this figure is far too low. So I would like the Minister to uh, make a commitment that this would be reviewed by the Housing Executive. Um, and I thank the member for his question. It's very important. Actually, it's worse than that. Uh, anyone fleeing, fleeing their home as a result of domestic violence isn't even considered intimidated. So that's, that's something that was featured in the review of the allocation of points under social, allocation of social points for housing. And I'm currently looking at that uh, because that's, that's an area that regardless of where we are in parties, we, felt, we all felt, even through debates, that it was unfair and unjust. Claire Bailey. Minister, um, given that five women that we know of so far have been murdered in their own home in Northern Ireland since during this lockdown, um, does the Minister think that there's any further measures can be put in place from her department to support the increase um, the increasing need on emergency refuge space? Um, I absolutely do think there is a need, particularly in areas outside of Belfast. So, for example, Cave Archibald had mentioned to me that in her area in Colrain there, there wasn't any emergency accommodation, and people from that area had to come into Belfast or Derry. So, when you're going through a trauma like that in the mouth of a global pandemic, to try and get succour and refuge, and to go somewhere outside of your family support is horrendous. So it is something I'm absolutely looking at. Uh, the other aspect of it is, is that it's the impact on children's schools as well. And even all those connections that we have and take for granted as families, we need to ensure that people who have been victim of abuse or psychological abuse or whatever it is, that you know, forces them to flee their home, that when they do get emergency accommodation, it is as close to their family support or their support systems, including schools, as possible. Ms. Cara Hunter. Thank you. Question two, please. Thank the member for her question. Uh, the new decade, new approach 
uh, deal included a commitment to extend the welfare mitigation schemes that my department currently delivers. And this, this was to ensure the continued assistance for vulnerable people who have lost their benefit due to welfare reform. So I can confirm that I absolutely do intend to introduce primary legislation to amend the welfare reform NI Order 2015 to provide for an extension of welfare mitigation payments for people affected by the so-called bedroom tax. A draft bill has been shared with the executive, my executive colleagues, and I am personally committed to securing an agreement to proceed as a matter of urgency. I will also bring forward new regulations to provide for the extension of the remaining mitigation schemes. These will be drafted affirmative, and I expect that they will be laid shortly after the bill has been introduced. And while the delay in progress in the legislation to extend mitigation schemes is not ideal, and I do stress that my department continues to make payments to those people who are eligible. This is possible because my department has agreed such contingency arrangements with the Department of Finance so that payments are currently made under the sole authority of the Budget No. 2 Act. These arrangements will continue and be kept under review. Ms. Hunter. Uh, I thank the Minister for her statement. Um, well, the new regulations uh, mentioned include additional mitigation for families affected by the benefit cap and the two-child uh, tax credit rule. Thank you. Well, they absolutely should, because there are three issues that the, even the uh, Cliff Edge Coalition have mentioned, but not just them on their own. So it's about the bedroom tax, it's about the so-called two-child rule, and it's also about benefit cap. Now, I know there are many other asks, but there are the three central points that we all have met these, uh, these coalitions on, and it's absolutely something that I envisage to be included in any future legislation and regulations. Karen Mullen. Last can call your Minister, will you give a commitment uh, to support the advice sector through the mitigation package, also given the crucial role that they play in assisting people in accessing their entitlements, but particularly uh, through this very challenging time? In short, yes, I will. Um, the advice sector has received money from the department, and the advice sector will say it will probably need to receive more. I'm at a section of the advice sector not so long ago, um, and I appreciate, and I said it to him at the time, so just let me take the opportunity to say it again, I appreciate the role that the independent advice sector has played, but particularly through COVID-19, because pe a lot of people were isolated, and along with community and bounty, people in, within the community and bounty sector were often the first responders, people who were finding themselves in really, really difficult circumstances. We can't take up work for granted. We need to keep investing in it. And where there are opportunities, and it is, it is where there are opportunities uh, to give additional support to do specific pieces of work, certainly this department, even under Dirty, particularly under Dirty Hargreaves Watch, was never found wanting. Ms. Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much, Deputy Speaker. Um, I would just like to start off by thanking the Minister absolutely for the, ex the planned extension for the welfare mitigations. It's, it's very much needed. But can I ask the Minister, will those welfare mitigations be reviewed to see if they are working and if there are any gaps that need also to be filled that aren't already considered? And will that review come to the committee then for us to, to look, at, look through and help you with that? The, 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 the member will know that uh, any substantial changes, I've always brought it to the committee, even in my short term, and I'll continue to do that. As a I still consider myself as a member of the committee, so, <laughs> so I, I, know, I know the crack. The issue is that there, there are gaps. There's always gaps. There's things we can do better. So if we can't even get those reflected in legislation, we most definitely need to get them reflected in the regulation. Um, but certainly... Uh, even just the three issues that I responded to in terms of the question that Cara posed. There are three issues that people, time after time, have raised with us that need to be sorted. If we have the time and the money to sort the rest, certainly we'll look at those. But there are three huge gaps that we need to try and plug. Mr Andy Allen. 
Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. And can I thank the Minister for her answers thus far and her commitment to extend and strengthen welfare mitigations. They're very important to mitigations and uh, mitigating against the, the worst impacts of welfare reform. Minister, uh, social sector size criteria, bedroom tax, will be around for a long time to come. It's not going away. We all know that, and we've all given a commitment to supporting those affected by it. Quite often, Minister, constituents of mine have approached my office to downsize from properties larger than what they require, but the current system does not enable them to downsize. Can you maybe advise, Minister, what work the Department, in conjunction with Housing Executive and Housing Associations, intend to undertake to support those who wish to downsize? Well, I think we need to ensure that the mitigations are kept, first of all. Um, for people who wish to downsize, it is not straightforward because the stock is not there, and that is the problem. And often enough, even for housing associations who attempted to build small, literary studio apartments, some of them, to, in preparation for the bedroom tax, they didn't get support for that because what happens is families end up living in tree boxes, so we can't have that. Uh, you will know that even through the reclassification, housing associations can't, you know, the, the right to buy scheme has ended, and we're looking at proposals for the housing executive. But certainly anyone who is going to leave a family home that they've probably brought their, fam- their own children and their grandchildren in to go somewhere. First of all, it needs to be appropriate accommodation. It also needs to be you know, proofed for living out their, their best years and make sure that the adoptions are there as well. So I'm just being straight with you. It's not straightforward. It's very, very cumbersome, but it's something that we absolutely have to look at, irrespective of bedroom tax or not, because such is the problem that we have. The increase in the demand for social housing is growing. But, and the supply isn't, and, the, and, and that's not going to be reconciled. It hasn't been, and we need to be uh, very mindful of what we're asking for, particularly in terms of ensuring that we have homes that are fit for purpose. Uh, and when it comes to downsizing, the experience right across the board is that that isn't always the case. Ms. Liz Kimmins. Margaret Askin, Corla, question three. Question three, please. Um, I thank the member for her question. Um, the voluntary and community sector have continued to provide uh, a frontline role uh, over the last six months, particularly in response to the global pandemic. And very often, had it has been acknowledged in this chamber, they were often seen as the first responders. So, in terms of the financial support, 1.5 million was directly uh, made through councils at the outset of the emergency to support community-led programmes for people in financial stress and need of food and those experiencing isolation. A further 3.2 million was allocated to support this work. 1.7 million pounds for the COVID Community Support Fund, 750,000 for an access to food fund, 700,000 for financial inclusion fund. The COVID-19 Charities Fund, 15.5 million was opened in June, and I will shortly open, uh, very shortly open applications for a 7 million pound social enterprise fund. My department is also providing a safe uh, reopening fund of £2.5 million to support a safe return to provision of face-to-face community services to all our people. Ms Kimmins. Margaret, and I thank the Minister for her response. I think it is very important to emphasise the, um, the impact of, of the, um, the measures taken by your department and, and when uh, our colleague Deirdre Hargy was uh, Minister as well, so it is important to commend that. Can I just ask the Minister then, in light of that, um, what your plans are to continue to support uh, the community voluntary sector as we continue to navigate through COVID-19? Well, I think the member and indeed other members in this House will agree that the, the work initiated by Deirdre Hargy on behalf of the Executive to support community and voluntary groups has been exemplary. Um, and as we move with easements, hopefully out of COVID, uh, that, that, that money and indeed that investment needs to continue, albeit in a different way. Uh, the member will be aware, even in her own constituency, the work of some of the neighbourhood renewal groups, um, and they are already working along the lines of what they can do in terms of anti-poverty. But you know, I think one thing that government right across the place cannot ignore is the way the community responded to help their friends, their families, their neighbours, and indeed communities that they normally wouldn't work with throughout this pandemic. And we need to protect that investment. Thanks to the Minister for her answers thus far. Does the Minister recognise the importance of community sport in a post-COVID environment and the need to financially support social sports to further build capacity in the system? 
Um, yes, I do recognise the, the role that sporting organisations have and indeed will continue to have. Um, I mean, even Jonathan will remember when we were on the committee that uh, a lot of sporting organisations were responsible for delivering food, delivering shelter, starting at people's garden gates, talking to them, particularly people in rural communities who were isolated, um, and that needs to be factored in. I think even the presentation that we received in Sport NI uh, actually showed that a lot of people were doing their best in a very, very difficult situation, and with the small bit of money that they received, they made be best use of it, but we certainly need to ensure that as part of community development, working in partnership, co-design and co-production, that sporting bodies and sporting small, small sporting groups are involved. Mr. Robbie Butler. Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, um, Minister, thank you for um, you, you called many of the, the, those involved in the sector first responders, and in many cases with regard to poverty and mental health, they indeed are. Um, can you identify, or can you tell us about any study that's been made to identify what services may be lost uh, as a consequence of any lack of funding, and what further support may be required to ensure that groups will survive through this crisis? In particular, I'm thinking of groups like Atlas Women's Centre and Via Wings and Jamore. Um, well, first of all, I am unaware of any group who has lost their funding, which is good news. Um, and if there are groups in the members' constituency, you can come to me on them. If anything, most received additional funding because of work that they are doing. I uh, visited Fire Wings in Dremore, um, and I have to say it was an absolute pleasure. Um, Fire Wings, like many other groups, particularly those coming from community and voluntary background, but maybe involved in faith-based work, um, actually took the food box and showed literally me how to make it stretch and to do more with it. So I don't know if that's an urban rural thing or whatever, but certainly we have a lot to learn. We in departments have a lot to learn from groups and um, I just commend the work that Fire Wings, but loads and loads of other groups have done and will continue and are continuing to do as we speak to help people who are vulnerable. Mr Mark Durkin. Thank you very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for her answers. I'd like to take this opportunity to commend uh, the community and voluntary sector for their invaluable work uh, throughout the COVID-19 crisis and, no doubt, beyond. Uh, the Minister has referred there to the fact that no groups have lost their funding. I wonder, could the Minister give a commitment to have a look at community and voluntary groups' vital lifelines in their communities who fall out with the normal funding streams? of her department. I can think of Eglinton Community Hall in my own constituency. They are not funded by DFC, however, they are an integral part of the fabric of the community, provide many services and were a lifeline throughout the COVID period. However, they've now had to, because they can't generate any rental income, they've had to resort to crowdfunding efforts to generate funding. Um, well I certainly will take on board even just from you know the two questions that have come up to find out what groups have lost out. The Small Charities Hardship Fund was exactly for that. It was for groups who did not have access to public funds and groups like that in Eglinton who are doing a good job and many others across the board. Will they need funding in the future? Absolutely. Uh, and there are many others out there and we have learned that from COVID-19, what people have done with a small bit of money. Um, so certainly, if a member wants to write to me about anything specific, I'm happy to you know, receive that correspondence and hopefully reply to it. And I'll also undertake to try and find out if any group lost out in any funds. Mr. Philip McGuigan. Question number four. I thank the member for his question. The commitment within the new decade, new approach uh, to tackle the maintenance backlog for housing executives properties reflects a much wider revitalisation programme aimed at securing the long-term future of social housing stock. And the member will be aware that the backlog of maintenance referenced in the new decade near approach is really significant. It estimates in 2018 uh, that £7.1 billion of investment is required over the next 30 years, with £3 billion required in the next 11 years to deal with the urgent backlog. Now, I appreciate that these are March 18 figures, but they are still stark. The housing executive simply can't afford this level of investment on its own. So this is a strategic issue of long-term significance, and it will require broad political and, and a social consensus. So part of the solution uh, 
will ensure that rents remain affordable and sustainable to housing executive tenants. We are currently looking through the NDNA process of other ways to try and meet this requirement. Uh, can I thank the Minister for her response and certainly thank her for her commitment to uh, affordable uh, rents. Uh, just following on from answer, can I ask uh, the Minister what approaches she is considering uh, to provide more social housing and uh, meet environmental protection needs? Well, the, the need to meet uh, social housing needs is a mammoth task. So. To be honest, I'm looking at you know exercises that were undertaken, like looking at the availability of land. I'm actually meeting with the newly formed partnership panel with local government to look at the whole local development plan process. Um, I'm asking the officials to talk to other officials in other departments um, and to try and get in to, to look to see what land has been banked and what land has been derelict. Um, because it is essential that we need to increase supply to reduce demand. In relation to the environment, we were not successful in getting the Green Homes Grant Scheme just yet, but I would anticipate that we would get a Barnet consequential. And certainly that is looking at things like ensuring that we reduce fuel poverty, we have uh, you know, new construction methods and so on, but, but well, we are committed to doing that anyway through what the housing associations do. But certainly, um, the challenge of increasing the supply of social housing and indeed affordable housing, it is one that we need to take for at least 10 years right across this executive to get met. Mr Roy Beggs. Well, Deputy Speaker, the Minister has indicated some £3 billion is needed over the next 10 years to maintain and modernise uh, housing executive homes. Clearly, the current model is not working. What action is being taken to bring about change and improvement? Because it's now our six months has passed since Stormus has returned, we need to have improvements, we need to have change, we need proposals. When are they coming? So it's three billion over the next eleven years, and even though they're twenty eighteen figures, it's probably reduced. And the member's right to ask where are the proposals? I think the main proposals were in the new decade, new approach, looking at the ability of removal of corporation tax that the housing executive, the only social landlord who has to pay corporation tax. And also looking at getting rid of historical debt. And I've already met my colleague, uh, Connor Murphy, to expedite that. Um, that in itself will mean that the housing executive can borrow money and build. Um, and that in itself is really needed. Uh, to, to be frank, we also need to stop blocking houses in each of our constituencies. Um, you know, there is some nimbyism out there for people who have got disabilities, for people who are old travellers, um, for people who are one religion or another. And that's held up the potential to develop sites. That needs to be knocked in the head. And we also need to ensure that the investment is there for a longer term programme. Because unless we seriously look at this and tackle this crisis in homelessness and in housing, then we are ensuring that three generations are going to be reared under one roof. And I don't think any of us want that on our watch. And you're right, we do need those proposals. So as soon as they're advanced through the NDNA piece, my department is working with other colleagues in local government right across this executive to try and get that restored. Ms Kelly Armstrong. Thank you very much. Minister, you have already mentioned um, the corporation tax issue. Could you give perhaps an outline of the guesstimate of how much money that the housing executive will have to repay the Treasury, um, because that will have an impact on the ability to maintain homes? Well, I've asked for, for those figures because the guesstimates are wild, to be frank, uh, Kelly, and probably like myself, you've got a couple of different sets of figures out there, even from um, you know, the, the housing executive in terms of what they'll need. I, I, I'm frankly hoping that this debt, for example, is removed and the corporation tax of over £13 million a year doesn't have to be paid. So that in itself will ensure that the, that the reserves can be built up, which the housing executive have, but they can use those reserves in a way that allows more houses to be built and more construction methods to be used. In answer to Philip's question, to make sure that these homes are energy efficient, efficiency uh, is there, and also to ensure that the, the homes are of the best possible standard. Members, I apologise. We have six minutes left, and we're still on question four, so I'm going to have to move on to the next question. Mr. Paul Frew. Speaker, question number five. Sorry, Paul, that wasn't at you, it was at the other Paul. Anyway, um, 
Anyway, oral hearings using technology options will commence with effect from the 20th of September this year. So face-to-face -face oral hearings are set to recommence from 20th of September in the main hearing centre subject to favourable outcome of risk assessment. It's always in brackets. So face-to-face -face oral hearings at venues are set to recommence from mid-October and again subject to the completion of risk assessment. Alternative accommodation options, I have asked, are also being sought to facilitate hearings in local towns and villages. Mr. Frey. And I thank the Minister for her answer. Uh, does the Minister agree with me? This is a critical uh, aspect of gaining support or getting support to the people who are most vulnerable. And the fact that it has taken the Department so long and they haven't even completed the risk assessments yet uh, is failing the people who need the the support the most. I have spoken to the Department of Justice, uh, who have their court venues open uh, and are waiting for these risk assessments. Can the Minister give this House a commitment that those risk assessments will be completed as soon as possible to allow people, most vulnerable people, the support that they require? Well, just to repeat again, I have given the member dates of when these hearings will commence, so the risk assessments are being done. I do not want a, a, a long process that actually people who are waiting, who perhaps they are due substantial amounts of money, if decisions are overturned, they will be waiting any further. I have also asked them to go out to where people are at, because anybody in receipt of these payments are suffering from a substantial level of disability. It is one of the most difficult benefits to get, so I want to make it as easy as possible. So I am not slowing anything down, so I want to give the member that assurance. And if he has evidence that I am, then he needs to come to the department. Mr Jerry Carroll. Thanks to the Minister for her answer so far. Given that the PIP application and appeals process was already traumatic for, for people, uh, and given the fact that the Department is, is still contacting people, uh, appealants to say they, have, uh, they can have appeals either uh, over the phone or video conferencing, which is uh, very unsuitable for many people, um, has the Department considered extending the time frame for people either being moved off the LA uh, or having to appeal PIP so they aren't under any more undue stress in a time of a health pandemic? Well, just let me give the member as much reassurance as possible. I have tried to be as flexible as possible to ensure the people who are most vulnerable aren't subjected to any further trauma or stress. Uh, and so that's, that's what we're trying to do. If face-to-face -face suits people, then it may. That, that may be the process. But if video conferencing or teleconferencing doesn't and the feel that they're at a disadvantage, we need to work to try and get that met. And if it means an extension, I'd certainly look at it. But from the evidence that I have up until now, and I've asked about this on a very regular basis, that it doesn't seem to be the case. And that's from people working in areas of, that suffer has deprivation who receive the highest levels of these benefits. But if it turns out to be something else, I look at it. Mr. Andy Allen. Speaker, as been highlighted, Minister, the appeals process is one that is very stressful and daunting um, to those going through it. Um, can the Minister highlight any actions or steps that her department is taking to clear any potential backlog within the system? Well, I'm sure the member will appreciate actually, you know, getting the system to go out to towns and villages has been a, a positive step. Uh, I mean, it's better. Like if you're if you're not from Belfast and you have to travel to Belfast for a hearing in a court setting, like that, I would feel that a bit daunting myself. So to try and get these hearings brought out to people is hopefully one way of reducing a bit of stress, but it's only a bit of stress, uh, and ensuring that whatever option they take is one that they're most comfortable with. And that's what we've tried to do in the Department for Communities, to support people who may be entitled to a lot more money that they're currently receiving. But certainly, you know, anything I can do to reduce the levels of stress that people are going through, waiting on an appeal, I certainly have a look at it. Ms Claire Bailey. Um, it has been brought to my attention. I am wondering if the Minister is aware that appealants of PIP and ESA are being sent multiple letters um, when they appeal to suggest that they should apply for a paper-based appeal, but um, this is not even informing them that they have a 30 times less chance of success with a paper-based appeal. Um, I am wondering if you are aware of this practice? I am um, not aware of the volume of it. I am aware that people have been offered a paper-based appeal as an option. But if you are saying that the paper-based appeal, I do not want to misquote or misrepresent you, but it sounds like what I heard is the paper-based appeal is of a such that in nature it is putting people off going for face-to-face. -face. I do not know. So I am happy 
to talk to the member to find out exactly what's going on. I know in my own constituency, paper-based appeals have been used, and it suited the clan, but it, that isn't going to suit everybody. Mr. Paul Given. Thank the member for his question. When I can find it. Um, so, at the outset of the emergency, Minister Hargey announced 1.5 million creative support, recognising that further support would be required. I secured an additional 4 million in the June monitoring uh, to reopen the fund, first for individuals, including freelancers and self employed within the sector, and then for organisations. Uh, this funding is in recognition of the importance of the vibrant arts sector for wider social and economic recovery. 20 seconds. Um, thank the Minister for that response. However, for the arts sector, they will be greatly disappointed. The United Kingdom, uh, through then a Barna Consequential, uh, we received £33 million, and today 36 signatories have penned a letter to all MLAs asking for urgent funding to be provided. As they put it, if they don't get this urgently, you're going to have a cultural wasteland. What action will the minister take to deliver? Otherwise, these organisations won't survive. Can I suggest to the minister that her half hour is up and she will write to Mr Given answering that question, outlining what actions she intends to undertake. We move on now uh, to topical questions, and I call Mr Justin McNulty. Universal credit is a complicated and, I believe, unjust benefit. The Minister will be aware of the situation where, depending on a claimant's other income, some months' payments are lower than others. This was, uh, this was successfully judicially challenged by Danielle Johnson, Danielle Johnson and the Child Poverty Action Group in London. Can the Minister advise when she is going to take account of that ruling? of the Court of Appeal in what was known as the Johnson ruling to help low-income families here. I thank the member for his question. Um, and what I will do is I will get him a written response, because it is very technical. Uh, in the regulations and when the, the legislation will be devolved back to this assembly, we have the ability to ensure that, unlike in England, there are mitigations continuing. So unlike England, we have mitigations on top. Uh, and we want to ensure that that happens. But I'd certainly, in relation to Danielle's case, I'll, I'll get the member a more, more fuller response. Mr McNulty? Can the Minister advise the House how many cases her department are dealing with of people who have been impacted by the ruling? And can she give a time frame for resolution? Well, I'll certainly I'll add that into the written response that I'll give to the member, uh, and including, if it's possible, any resolution. Dr. Steve Aiken. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, I would like to ask the Minister to join me and thank the many community groups, sporting groups, and indeed church groups across Northern Ireland and particularly across South Antrim who have made their facilities available for schools, particularly as we've been looking to the problems of the COVID pandemic. I certainly would, and the member was at here throughout the questions, and he will know genuinely uh, delighted of the partnership that will develop as right across the community and voluntary sector, sporting groups, faith-based groups uh, throughout COVID. Uh, I want that relationship to, to endure beyond COVID, and it needs to be recognised through investment from the executive. Dr Aiken. And thank you very much indeed for the Minister for your remarks thus far. I think and I would like the Minister to engage closely with the Minister for Education as well so that there is a list made available of these facilities that have been supported by her department and by the Northern Ireland Executive over the last couple of years. So those are indeed available for schools, because I think, regrettably, we may be heading for another spike in COVID, and anything we can do to keep the maximum number of children in education as possible would be very much appreciated. Right to the Minister of Education to see if we can take it forward, but I have not met no resistance whatsoever from the Department of Education or the Education Authority in relation to using facilities, using school infrastructure like buses and things like that to help communities. And I would be shocked. I'm not saying the member suggesting that, but I imagine because usual all the risk assessments and all the reasons about something you can't do, they were all overcome. People seen that the sky didn't fall in when those partnerships happened and they need to be supported uh, for the future, hopefully without a second spike. Mr Colin McGrath. Mr. Speaker, 
Could I ask the Minister for an update on the Housing Allocation Scheme, a review of which was undertaken many years ago? And I understand that it might have reported back, uh, but there has been no introduction of the findings of the review, or um, have they been published? Could I ask for an update on that? Yeah, sure. uh, Colm, um, and I mentioned uh, that I think it was Steve Aiken's question, particularly around domestic violence, that you know, intimidation points for people suffering from it, domestic violence was included in a lot of the responses the parties give. I'm currently looking at those. Um, and I will be going to the committee uh, after that because we need to change the way allocations are made. We need to sh- ensure there's a fairer system. Uh, I remember the debate we had in this House uh, that when um, we looked at um, t- intimidation points and as sure as whatever, that as soon as a new scheme comes, the levels of people claiming to be intimidated went through the roof. We need better and stronger verification of intimidation. But certainly the allocation looks at many, many other areas. And I, I am giving you a commitment and other members today that we're actively looking at that as we speak. Mr McGrath. Uh, and I welcome that because there is a large scheme in Downpatrick of over 100 houses that are currently being constructed. Um, there is a concern that the latent demand that is done in the housing executive identifies a need, but whenever it comes to the allocation, there are people from outside the area in big numbers that get attracted. So could that idea of locality for a certain proportion of the houses in social housing schemes for local people to that area to meet that latent demand which has been identified be considered? Um, that is actually illegal. So, but I hear what the member is saying. So, if I understand the member right, and I don't want to put words in his mouth, the local people who are languishing on a housing waiting list should have the aspiration and the hope and indeed the expectation to live somewhere locally. And what happens is people from other areas who claim to be intimidated come into an estate, get brand new houses, and then move from one estate to another. So, I, I completely sympathise with that, and we need to ensure that that doesn't happen. Uh, in terms of you know, if local people have that area as their local choice and they have the points they need to get it, but it goes back to your first question, when are we going to look at the points to ensure that those people get it? Even any new system will not ensure that happens, but what we need to do is to look at better ways of testing out genuine intimidation cases from those who, I think in this House, uh, people were right across this uh, piece were dismissed for what they were doing. Mr. Andrew Muir. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. My question to the Minister is why there has been a delay in delivering the Northern Ireland equivalent of the Kickstart scheme. Uh, that was announced by the Chancellor, and it was £2 billion of funding on the 8th of July. The scheme has actually been launched on the 2nd of September, but there is still no scheme been launched in Northern Ireland. I want to understand why the delays. Um, well, I, first of all, the scheme will be launched in November, and I want to get it right. I want it to be a bespoke scheme. I don't want it to be just a replication of, for example, steps at work or anything else. I don't want young people to be sanctioned. I also want to include young people who have autism and are on the spectrum. I also want to ensure that employers are including those youngsters and not doing it um, just willy-nilly or piecemeal. And I also want to make sure that we have an opportunity that see the lessons learned throughout COVID and the response from community and voluntary sector, that they too can be considered as employers unlike the scheme. So um, that, that, that's the position that we're in at the minute. I had a meeting on this this morning. We're looking at a bespoke response to needs that we already know. And I'd be also doing meetings with service providers, with employers, and indeed with the Children's Commission on this as well. Mr Muir. Mr Principal Deputy Speaker, what targets does the Minister have for participation in the scheme? And can she give an assurance to the House today that those Barnet consequences which have been received and that money which will be allocated to your department to run this scheme will not be surrendered at the end of the year as a result of the inability to spend the funding? So, no surrender, really? Is <laughs> anyway, um, I, I, I think it's a mortal sin to send money back to the British Treasury, to be quite honest with you. I want to ensure that, um, that the young people who we know now who need this scheme get the best possible scheme. I mean, there's lots of things you could say about previous schemes. I, I just want to learn on what didn't work to try and look at the needs of young people now, look at what we've come through in terms of this pandemic, and ensure that that whole experience and that partnership approach of getting young people meaningful employment, albeit for six months, is taken on board, and that's where we're at. Mr. Mark Durkin. 
Minister, Principal Deputy Speaker, thank the Minister for her answers thus far. Uh, reference was made earlier to the plight of the arts sector and the impact of COVID on arts venues, practitioners and uh, patrons. The Minister outlined uh, the measures that her department had implemented to support those working or sadly not working at the moment in the industry. Could she provide the House with an update on the £33 million Barnet Consequential that came over to the Executive and her efforts to get it to help the arts sector here? I thank the member for his question. Um, so I have made a bid for that £33 million. I, I, I know it will either be discussed this week, but at the very latest next week. So the bid's in. Um, and I have communicated that. But I fully understand, particularly where people are at in terms of the sector. I mean, they literally, their livelihoods stopped overnight as a result of COVID, actually stopped overnight. And I want to ensure that very, very soon, and I've been, we've had discussions with Arts Council, we've had discussions with lots of fora and lots of consoria right across the board. We want to make sure we get the bid in, the bid's accepted, and then we get the money out as soon as possible. Thank you and thank the Minister for her answer. I wish you well uh, with your bid and I'll take Mr Gibbons' earlier question as an indication of support from the DUP for that bid. Getting the money in to the Department is one thing, getting it out to those who need it is another. Can the Minister give us an assurance that her officials have been working with the Arts Council and others to design a scheme to ensure that the money gets to where it is needed? and it does so in a, as quick a way as possible? So first of all, yes, I will ensure that um, the money gets to people who need it. Um, there are also lots of groups and lots of individuals and freelancers and independents who don't get money from the Arts Council, and we need to make sure you know, the, that they, they are included as best possible, as best possible as we can. Um, and, you know, I do think that there is a lot of expectation. I also have had no indication whatsoever that there's any difficulties with this proposal. Uh, uh, the Minister for Finance has taken a raft of bids and mines is in the queue. He won't tell me where it's in the queue, but it's in the queue, and I would imagine that we'll be hearing announcements on some announcements very, very shortly. Mr Philip McGuigan. Uh, in terms of online gambling accounts, uh, can I ask the Minister if her department has any plans to ban uh, withdrawal reversals, as is happening elsewhere? Well, we'll we are certainly looking at legislation around gambling and looking at all those options. Um, I mean, what's happened elsewhere has been almost 10, 15 years of work, and despite you know, many attempts here, we need to take it to uh, another level, and certainly online gambling and problem gambling is something that we need to look at uh, to put protections in for people as best as we can, and we are looking at different stages of legislation starting in this ma mandate as soon as possible. Mr McGregor. Uh, I welcome uh, the Minister's answer and her commitment to introduce legislation in this mandate, and obviously we will work uh, to ensure that that uh, uh, works. Uh, and obviously, regulation is key in reducing gambling-related harm, but it is also a public health issue. Can I ask the Minister if she is working with her executive colleague, the Minister of Health, to ensure that health is addressing some of the harm as a result of problem gambling? I have met with um, Robin Swan uh, on problem gambling and indeed the uh, modernisation of liquor licensing as well. Uh, we discussed even minimum price alcohol procedures. We've discussed it all because at the end of the day, you know, it's everybody's business. Mental health is every executive minister's business. And I just wanted to assure him of the steps that we're taking to work together to try and support people who've got addiction, who are going through families, are going through crisis, uh, and basically just to see what else that we can do very practically across each of our departments. Ms Kelly Armstrong, although I warn you, may not get a supplementary. Ms Armstrong. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Minister. Minister, um, we are only six months away from the Department of Work and Pensions um, finishing their contract with the Post Office. Um, it is incredibly important that in rural areas there is um, work done with the Older Persons Commissioner and the Economy to find out how banks will allow these older people to get access to their accounts. Could you maybe outline um, what work you are doing to try to um, calm people's nerves with the removal of their Post Office um, accounts? Well, I mean, the member will know it's a reserved issue. However, post offices are part of communities, so 
I will go back and ask officials what we're doing in terms of any work with other departments um, and, and just take it from her. And I will I'll write down member with any response. Thank you, members. The, that concludes questions to the Minister for Communities. The next item on the agenda is questions to the Assembly Commission. But if I ask members just to take their ease for a few minutes to allow the relevant people to exit the chamber and the relevant people to enter it. Thank